All right, everybody, welcome back. I'm Rich Folly. We're at the we're at PBS Books, and we're at the Miami Book Fair 2018. This amazing several-day spectacle, the celebration of books here in the heat of Miami. It's wonderful. And I'm sitting right now with a voice, and today the face of NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, Peter Sagal, and also the author of The Incomplete Book of Running. It's so nice to have you, Peter. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Rich. Yeah, I was talking to you earlier. This voice is something that five million of us, five million know so well. And yet, when you see the face, it's always a little disconcerting. I'm no, very well aware of that. It works for me. It I appreciate works for that. Me. A lot of people stare at me, and they're like, no, I never imagined. <laughs> I never imagined it was that that the voice was coming out of. So yeah. it takes a while to get used to. Well, you have many talents. You're a performer, obviously. And wait, wait, don't tell me. You're very funny, and everybody knows your, uh, your, your humor. Uh, but you're a writer, too. And this yeah. book, and, and it's, now we know, for anybody who's read the book, you're a runner. Yes. And you've been a runner for most of your life. More on or less, and on and off, more on now than off, but yeah. that's sort of part of the story is how I left it, came back to it, and why. Yeah, it's one of those things where uh, people always ask, people who are obsessed or really love running, what are you running to? What are you running? Why do you run? What is it for you that sends you out onto the roads every day? It, it, it's funny, I didn't really know, and I had to write a book to find out. I mean, there's this old thing that you write what you know, and I've, my whole life, even when I was a playwright, I always would write things I don't know and want to find out. And I've been writing about running for a long time. And until recently, I never thought that anybody who didn't run would ever want to hear any of it. I wrote about it for Runner's World, which is read by runners, and we leave the rest of the world alone and don't bore them with their stories. But I, I went through some interesting experiences uh, that were somewhat connected to running and some not, one of which was the bombing of the Boston Marathon in 2013, where I was. Yeah, which you ran I, that year. I had just finished the marathon guiding a blind runner, and the bombs went off just behind us. That was a fairly interesting event, and that was happening the same time that my marriage of many years was exploding, to be metaphorical. And as I went through the following year, the, the, the year of my family dissolving and that year of the bombing, I realized that as I experienced everything that happened, running played a huge part in it, not just because I had been running the marathon when the explosion happened, but because it turns out that running had taught me a lot of things that I didn't know. Uh, that I needed to know about endurance and persistence and patience and putting up with a lot of misery, which is something you learn. It's called endurance sports for a reason. So the book ended up being, uh, it's, a bit of, it's a bit of work of evangelism. I do think people should run. If not run, do something outside. We're all locked inside staring at, well, tablets and screens. But it's also a book about how I learned what I needed to know to get through something that I never expected to go through. Yeah. You know, there's something that runners start to understand as they're out there, whether you run a mile, which is really just about, if you're just starting to run especially, it's just about sort of surviving that mile, right? Yeah. But when you run maybe two or three miles and you start to sort of get into a rhythm or a pace and your mind starts to work differently than it does when you're just running as fast as you can, you start to think about things and ruminate and yeah. solve problems. Yeah. In fact, one of the things I say in the book that's gotten some attention is that I say people should not run with headphones. Leave the headphones behind. Very controversial. And people are like, oh, what do you mean? I, somebody among the many people who objected to this said, oh, man, I, I can't spend that much time with my own thoughts. My own thoughts and I don't get along. To which I say, well, if you're not getting along with your own thoughts, shouldn't you spend more time together? Yeah. Shouldn't you have counseling? Shouldn't you like hang out, see what's going on, see if you can agree with about things? Like, it, it's it's one of the things that amazes me about the way that we live now, is we are constantly besieged by input. We do it to ourselves. We're looking at our screens. We're checking our phones at stoplights. If we can't look at our screens, then we're put in headphones or turning the radio or a podcast. There's not a moment in the day where we, the most sophisticated people who are animals that have ever existed on this earth, are content to just sit and think. And so for me, running has become as much meditation as exercise. Yeah. I got up this morning and I ran five miles without headphones in downtown Miami. And I thought things and I saw things and maybe these things aren't particularly important, the things that I thought, but I thought them. Yeah. I was able to sort of get in touch with what I was, what's going on in my own head, whatever they be, anxieties, worries, desires, fears, ideas. And most of us spend all day clamping them down. Yeah. Go outside, listen to your head. I understand that. And I joke around, around with people that I know that run, that I solve all the problems of the world when I'm out there. I don't know if I always remember them when I get back, but I am really thinking. And I, 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 I read your 
chapter on the earphones thing. And I know that it's been controversial because runners love to run with music a lot of times. Yeah. I, I am one of those people where I can't listen to a podcast or an audio book or anything, but the music becomes the background noise to my brainwave. So I, I've been able to sort of balance it, I think, but I'm trying it now without them just to see. Music is another yeah. thing. Most people want to distract themselves through yeah. the podcast these days or radio or spoken word. Music is another issue, but I still think even there, yeah. I mean, there are rhythms of your own self, there are rhythms of your heartbeat, there are rhythms, rhythms of your feet that it pays off to pay attention to. Yeah. And one of the things that I'm arguing against in the book is this notion that running is mindless. Most people think of it as like this interminable thing that sometimes you were forced to do, most often in gym class when you misbehaved. And one of the arguments is, is that we think that because we have been told that. We've been told that by gym teachers who punished us. We're told that by people who say, oh, running is so boring. Uh, we're told that by a, an athletic culture where if you don't buy expensive equipment or go to the latest class or have pounding music playing, you're not doing it right. Mm -hmm. Running is something that is accessible to everyone which is one of the reasons I think that companies who want to sell you stuff don't like it. It's doable by anyone. There are no skills necessary. We all can do it. Next time you're late for a bus, you'll do it. But mainly, it's all something we lost. I was, this happens all the time. It just happened. I was in Portland, and I was down in the Esplanade by the river, and I saw a little kid with his family, and the little kid was running around, just running around, just shrieking with delight. And we all used to do that. If you see dogs, dogs do it. All animals run for pleasure because it's a joy. And that gets beaten out of us by yeah. the culture we live in. And I'm like, no, forget about it. Take off the headphones, forget about the classes, just run. Yeah, it is wonderful. I, I agree with you. But there are some other elements. You're right, you know, as I read this book, yes, it's a, it's a love of running. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But there were some big things happening in your life. And you infused this personal... And the things that people who maybe listen to Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me don't, don't know about you. Yeah. Um, your family, your marriage that was breaking up at the time. You're running in that famous 2013 Boston Marathon. At the time, I think it was your second or third Boston Marathon, third. Uh, I think. It was my third Boston Marathon, yeah. And you were running with a blind runner, William mm -hmm. Greer. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about just sort of that whole experience? Because at the time, he was really struggling and carried you across there, you carried him across no, the line. No, he carried he both of us. Yeah. So a marathon is, if you ever, have you ever run one? I've never run one, no. A marathon is hard, yeah. to put it mildly, although it's accessible. I think anybody with enough time and effort can run a marathon. Not necessarily fast, but it's doable. But one of the things about a marathon is you train very hard over a long period of time, and then it's the day, and you don't know what's going to happen. Right. There's all sorts of physics going all on. All kinds there. of things that could happen that could go wrong. It's a long way to run. A lot of things could go wrong. And that day, things were not going well for Williams. So he was a well-trained runner who had hoped to run in 345, three hours, 45 minutes. Didn't make it, was having a lot of trouble, had to stop and walk, which itself is bad because if you stop and walk, your legs start to seize up. So he was declining. And I really got invested in his success. Part of that had to do with the fact that I wasn't really welcome at home anymore for reasons that I can't really get into. And um, I was excited and emotionally invested in having somebody I could take care of because, well. And so at the end of the race, as we approached the ending and he was walking, I said, William, you really got to run the last mile of the Boston Marathon. It's the most famous mile in running. The right on the Hereford Street, the left on the Boylston, the people cheering. You can't walk that, man. You got to run it. And he didn't think he could do it. But amazingly, to me, maybe to himself, when we got to that last mile, he picked it up. And he ended up running that last mile on guts, adrenaline. He had nothing left. And it was amazing. And people cheered. And I uh, tell people his name. And they were all cheering William. And we crossed the line and at 4.05 on the race clock. It wasn't a good race by his standards. But he had done something that I thought was heroic, running that last mile. And we were still standing there in the finish line, sort of celebrating and trying to recover when the bomb went off, bombs right behind us. Yeah, plural. Plural bombs, and it was the loudest noise I'd ever heard. This is not the sort of thing that happens at a marathon usually, and it took us a while to figure out what had gone on, but once I figured out what had happened, that there were terrorist bombs that had hurt and killed a lot of people right behind us, it occurred to me that if he hadn't run that mile, if he hadn't gutted it out for his own pride, for his own sense of satisfaction, just to be able to know that he had done it, 
we would have been walking up to the finish line right, right about the bombs went on. He was 409, the yeah, bombs were, exactly. bombs were 409, he was 404. Something like that. And, um, you know, obviously we didn't know there were bombs, but it, it just goes to show that sometimes uh, when you're going through, as uh, Winston Churchill purportedly said, but didn't, when you're going through hell, sometimes the best thing to do is uh, keep going, yeah. which is what he did. What an amazing experience. You were on the air that day with Robert Seale, yeah, too. Yeah, it was weird. I got to be, my one time as a genuine NPR news correspondent, yeah. I was very proud. Yeah. I remember sort of standing up a little stiffly and saying, don't make fart jokes, don't make fart <laughs> jokes, don't make fart jokes. It's serious now. It was serious. You know, um, the book is... The incomplete book of running. The title is is based on Jim Fix's yeah. famous 1970s tome on running. Uh, he became the face of running in the 1970s. Another era. The people probably coming up and running now don't even know who he is, but he really transformed running at the yeah. time. Like th there was a 70s running boom, which if you're not old enough to remember, it is one of the many historical events that Forrest Gump references. Right. When Forrest Gump starts running. He's credited, as he's credited with all these other historical things, for starting this huge running boom in the late 70s. It wasn't Forrest Gump. It was Jim Fix. Jim Fix was, uh, the, the famous story is he was overweight, he was smoking, he was an editor in New York. He started running, he lost weight, he stopped smoking, his health improved, his life improved. And he wrote this, this book called The Complete Book of Running, which everybody had. It everybody had it. Everybody had it. I, I can't even think of a modern equivalent, a book that like everybody had about exercise and, and fitness. And it started this huge running boom. There were people running, and that's when Adidas and Nike became huge. That's when, you know, Nike took that, some Coach Bowerman, you know, took his waffle yeah. iron, made soles for those new running shoes. Um, and it influenced my father, who was part of that running boom, and it influenced me. I mean, I sat as a pudgy 15-year-old in my, you know, my father's library, taking down that book and reading about, oh, if only you ran, you'd be thinner. If only you ran, you'd be happier. I was neither thin nor happy. If only you ran, you could eat whatever you wanted. I did eat whatever I wanted, but it wasn't working out so well for me. And, and, I, and in a weird way, you know, my book is, is, is a tribute to him, yeah. who started me and so many other people running. But it's also, a, a, you know, let me put it this way. I don't think running will solve yeah. all your problems. It's not the antithesis. It's a, it's a, it's a funny side. Yeah. It's that. It's, it's the that. Shoe it's the shoe flying, flying off. off. The, yeah. And it's also, it's a little, it's a little bit of wish fulfillment in yeah. that the cover of Jim Fix's book is his own legs, uh, photographed mid-stride, mm -hmm. and they're beautiful. Michelangelo. It's a good 70s font, by yeah, the way. Yeah, 70s font. Michelangelo yeah. himself could never have carved more beautiful legs than right. Jim Fix's. And that was another thing you'd look at and go, wow, imagine being that, I don't know, beautiful. And, uh, I always wondered if I'd ever have my own legs in the cover of a book, and I had to do it myself, but I have achieved it. Yeah, well, the, the, other, the odd thing, too, about Jim Fix, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a sad irony, yeah. that he was 52 and he died of a massive heart attack while running. Yep. And it makes me, it's something that, as somebody of a kid of the 70s that I've never forgotten, as right. I'm hitting the streets and the roads and the country roads out near my home, I still am sort of haunted by thoughts of Jim Fix out there. Many like, people were. When Jim Fix died, it was this extraordinary moment because he was the guy who was saying to everybody, run, it will make you healthy, you'll live forever. And they literally found him by the side of the road, dead of a massive yeah. heart attack. Just like they say, if you run, you'll drop dead. It was like my Jewish grandmother. I carried my driver's license with me at all times for just, just that Jim reason. Fix reason. Yeah. And there are, you know, there are a lot of people at the time who said, well, you shouldn't run. And then there were people, some of whom I talked to, who knew Jim Fix and said, well, he was really into health, but he never went to the doctor. Maybe if he had, they would have found out that he had this cardiac flaw that had killed his father and eventually killed him. But, you know, the, the message and movement outlived him. And uh, I, I've actually corresponded with his son, who uh, responded to my writing about Jim Fix in, his, uh, in Runner's World. and was very appreciative of the fact that he's still remembered. And there are still people who get out and go running because of one, what Jim Fix told them to do. Yeah. Um, we have a couple more minutes, but the one thing that... Uh, I talked about with you briefly is that when I started to run uh, more seriously and did read Runner's World and you start to want to tell your running stories to people yeah. randomly and you become a kind of an annoyance to other yes. people unless they're in the running community as yes. it were. Nobody wants to hear about yeah. you talking about nobody, running. So I wrote a book about it. Nobody wants to talk about your times or anything. It's, it's a very personal thing, right? Unless you run in running groups and you have a place you can yeah. spill it out. You, you, you advocate running groups. But the idea of calling yourself a runner was, a, was a, something I had to pass through. I don't do it proudly yet, but I, but I feel like I can say it out loud now that I'm a runner. It's like calling yourself an artist or a writer. Yeah. Well, when were you able to say that I'm uh, a runner? That's a really good question, and it's something I write about a little bit because there's a little bit of, um, I don't know what the word is, uh, self-importance about it. You know, do you jog or do you run? 
Yeah. Are you a runner or are you a jogger? And my view is it's a little bit like being an artist. There's, if you are an artist, if you get up and make art, then you're an artist. People used to ask me when I wrote for a living primarily, how do you become a writer? Like you write. If you write, you're a writer. Similarly, if you get up every day, every other day and run, if it's a part of your life, it's something you do as part of your day, then you're a runner. I don't care how fast you're going. I don't care how many races you've done. I certainly don't care how many races you've won. I've never won a race in my life. Um, it's about making something part of your life and devoting yourself to it. And if you do that, then you have every right to call yourself a runner. If you're somebody who just runs like three times a week on the treadmill at the gym for cardio before you start your, you know, your weights, go outside. Go outside. Go outside. That's from Peter Sagal. The, I, the recommendation is go outside. Yeah, here we are in Miami. The, uh, there are people running on treadmills, and it's beautiful here. Yeah. Go outside. Yeah. There's an ocean there you can run next to. I'm telling you, it's nice. Well, I will. And I'm very thankful that you came in to talk about the book today. And for the, for the millions of listeners for Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, 20 years now. 20 in, years, yeah. Uh, continually growing your audience now, the podcast and the radio and everything else happening keeps growing. Thank you for all that as My, well. It's great. We do it, we do it as much for ourselves to keep ourselves cheerful as we do it for the audience. So yeah. thanks to everybody for listening. Well, it's good to have your voice here in this room today. Thanks so much, Peter Thank Sagan, you, Rich. A real pleasure us. to be here. All right, folks. There's lots more to come today. I'm Rich Folly, and you are watching... PBS Books at the Miami Book Fair 2018.